Hello, friends. Welcome to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and I'm very glad to be with you this week, as every week, trying to bring you conversations with the most interesting people we can find on the most interesting topics for our listeners. And hopefully our conversations will have good and wonderful consequences for you. I know they do for me. You can listen to Conversations with Consequences on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network on Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, or you can catch the Encore at 5 p.m. We are also on Sirius XM channel 130. Of course, our radio show is always a podcast and you can go to the catholicassociation.org slash podcasts or directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. We are on every platform and always very glad to have more listeners. This week, we have a great show for you as we try to give you every week. So many kids are heading back to school. Parents are paying attention to what they're learning now more than ever. We've invited our friend Nikki Neely. She founded the organization called Parents Defending Education, But first, there have been some stories lately that have lit up the internet. There's a very tragic story about a mother and daughter plotting to kill the daughter's unborn child already at 30 weeks using chemical uh, drugs for abortion that they found on the internet. And also an all-out attack by the Atlantic magazine on Catholics linking the rosary to gun extremists. The rosary as an extremist symbol, a violent extremist symbol. We thought we'd take up these two stories Me, along with uh, my good friends and colleagues at the Catholic Association, Ashley McGuire and Lee Sneed. Thanks for joining me today, Ashley and Lee. Hi, Gracie. Oh, great. Great to be with you, Gracie, as always. We have so much to talk about this week, a huge plethora of things that are happening out there. One of them very interesting, a story out of the Atlantic magazine, um, which is a bastion of sort of left of center thought, a real of of the intellectuals, right? The intellectuals all read the Atlantic. And um, it was a crazy article talking about how people who pray the rosary are extremists who also are the kind of people that would own AR-15s. Yeah, the article was actually, (laughs) I feel like there's been a lot of journalistic blows out there lately, but this, I think, (laughs) takes the cake. (laughs) It was it was painful to read. I, I mean, it was one of those where was the editor was the editor on vacation because, you know, usually at least they try to conceal just a little bit their bigotry. But no, I mean, basically, well, and it was so bad that they had to change the headline. The headline went so viral. I forget the original headline. It was something like how the rosary became an extremist symbol. Yes, um, <laughs> that's like, exactly what it was. <laughs> like, what? Um, what are you talking about? And then they changed it to something like how right wing traditionalists co-opted the rosary. And I got to say, you know, the author talks about all of this whole culture of people who post all these pictures of their AR-15s with rosaries draped over them. And I'm like, you know, I'm pretty active on social media and I have a wide range of Catholic friends that, you know, include some very traditionalist type. I've never seen any any of this anywhere. (laughs) I I have no idea what this guy was talking about. And it just seemed like a really, really tendentious, I don't even know, just a shot off the bow at at, at Catholicism. Yeah, I totally agree, Ashley. I had never seen any of it. And I thought, like, do I go looking for this? Or I I didn't. And then I decided I didn't want to really go down that rabbit hole. Uh, But yeah, and it's the total like misunderstanding or maybe just purposeful misappropriation of the term spiritual warfare to conflate it with, you know, AR-15s and people wanting to kill their enemies. And then saying that, you know, how that is a hypocritical, you know, stance for a Catholic to take. And it just, everything just seems so half-baked, alarming insanity. You know, um, when you think about how far away these journalists are, this uh, someone like him, but you see it all the time in the media, they are so far away from understanding what Catholicism is, how it how it works in the United States and across the world, what it is like to be a faithful Catholic. They seem to be living in a different universe where they've never walked, they've never seen a Catholic, or if they've seen one, they've never had an in depth conversation with them. Don't you think, Ashley, that there is a really huge divide, just even of knowledge, of experience between journalists and Catholics? Right, which is sad because the tr- true job of a journalist is to like go in and ask questions questions and 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 learn about the thing that it is that they're reporting about. You know, I kind of laughed because the article was specifically about this like American subculture, supposedly that, you know, again, I've never even seen or 
didn't know existed. But I love that the author was Canadian. And then the one like theologian they quote is Massimo Fagioli, who's this Italian theologian who always he loves to weigh in on American culture, Catholic culture and politics. And I'm always like, what are you talking about? Like, you don't know anything about American culture, politics. But, you know, what I did like was the way it led to this kind of immediate boom and hilarious memes, like the one of the Dominican sister, or maybe it was the Sisters of Life, but no, I think it was Dominicans who have wear the rosary draped through their belts. And it's like, look at all these extremists. <laughs> You know, yeah. <laughs> and it, also led to a, it also led to a boom in rosary sales and, you know, spike in people reading about the rosary. So to the point about the spiritual warfare, it's so interesting because I just was reading yesterday about this prominent exorcist who said the single most effective way to combat evil is the rosary and that the devil says every time you say the Hail Mary, it's like a blow to my head. So, you know, they kind of pick the wrong thing to mess with. <laughs> Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And I think that this mistake that journalists make over and over again, and, you know, a lot of just contemporary culture makes is somehow that things like praying the rosary and just the devil and all these things are sort of antiquated ideas that the modern day Catholic doesn't really embrace or isn't a part of, whereas the rosary is just as normal as like, you know, washing your hands after you blow your nose. I mean, it, it's it's an essential part of every, you know, most Catholics lives. Never, I can't imagine. I mean, I like everyone I know has had at least one or two on their person at all times. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's not even as, you know, as rare as, you know, say veiling at mass, which, you know, some people might think is out of the ordinary. This idea that somehow our belief system is so antiquated. And I think that's why they like to concentrate on pre-Vatican II, post-Vatican II, and, and how they're sort of out of date on, you know, what, you know, kinds of beliefs that, that, that other non-Catholics think, think the Catholic Church should hold, you know, in these modern times. I also found it really interesting that they hooked it up to an AR-15. And as you say, Ashley, as you mentioned, I've never seen any kind of connection between rosaries and, and high-powered guns. And I don't understand how they made that connection, where they found it, how how deep they dug in the web to find that connection. Why would they, and I'm speculating why, why would they con- try to connect the rosary to to gun culture? Why do you think, Ashley? I genuinely don't know because I feel like the church has actually been pretty outspoken against gun violence. And it's just, it's hard really to have an answer other than they, rather than uh, being journalists who seek out the truth, they are like heat seeking missiles looking for a grain of sand to make, to conflate into a larger story that makes the Catholic Church look bad. And, you know, given that the church has been on the front lines of, you know, the abortion issue, I think right now the church is public enemy number one to, to to use their uh, warfare lingo for the press. And, you know, they just, they have a terrible track record when it comes to the way they report about and and write about the church. Um, but, you know, as I said earlier, this was sort of like the low point. And I, I think people kind of, I didn't really see a lot of people speaking up to defend the author or the article, because I think even, even they could see this was a pretty shoddy piece of journalism. Yeah, and definitely clickbait. I mean, because, I mean, when I first right. saw it, I couldn't, I couldn't help but click on it myself. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure lots of people did. They're like, what? Hey, what's going on? What, cra- new, what new crazy thing is happening? And then when you realize, wow, this is pretty unsubstantiated. Like, what? where is this happening? Who is this happening to? Who is perpetuating this myth? And again, I think it's just that they don't know. They don't know what, they don't care to know what the rosary is and what that prayer, you know, means for us, what spiritual warfare means for us. And like you said, Ashley, I think the Dobbs case has just put us right out in front. And if you can label from any angle, anyone who believes in the right to life of the unborn and you got to label them an extremist and you have to associate them with other groups that you know are also hated and try especially even after this this sort of weird tangent into saying that a lot of the far-right extremists were anti-Catholic, but somehow now we're all together on this issue. I, di- I, didn't, I didn't understand that thread at all either, but somehow we all need to be lumped together for it to make sense for people who are upset with Dobbs, who don't like religion. It just seemed like a very, very half-baked attempt to glop us all together. It's interesting because the rosary actually is something that if you took, if you look at, if you took a look at it from the very much, from very much the outside, even not understanding Catholicism, from today's and from today's way of you know mindfulness and chanting and mm-hmm. uh, yoga and meditation and all those things, it seems to fit in quite perfectly. I was I was reminded of that yesterday 
my husband and I were with some people who weren't Catholic and they were talking about difficulty sleeping. So my husband said, you know, what I do is I say a rosary and when I can't sleep in the middle of the night, it immediately calms me down. And usually I fall asleep halfway through the first decade. And so all these people said, well, what, what do you mean? What's a rosary? <laughs> and, oh, wow. and he had to start from a very non-Christian perspective. He said, well, the rosary is like, you might think of it as a kind of mindfulness and, and you might think of it as a kind of, of way of, you know, connecting in, in a very peaceful way way with 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 the big unknown with the universe you know and then and then he brought it home right. you know he brought it home to catholicism eventually but he wanted to start out with that and 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 it surprises me that people could see something as as human there's something really human about the rosary the way we we hold it in our hands and we count the beads and 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 we repeat and repeat and repeat and it's it's very very i think something you can find across culture and across time in one shape or another yeah we're not even the only ones who use beads to count prayers. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 really it's a a common thing. I mean, if you know if, if it's chanting, you know, a mantra or you know whatever. It, I mean, obviously the rosary holds a special place for us. The idea of a repetitive prayer is like you say, Gracie, just a really a human technique to connect with whatever it is you feel drawn to connect with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> with the great, uh, with the creator, with how, however you conceive of the creator, right? right. Yeah. And and it, it was, you know, who I, who came out against this attack by the Atlantic was Bishop Barron, Bishop Robert Barron. I was surprised he did a, a little YouTube video about it short. It's worth watching, you know, because he's so, he, he's so authoritative and, and, and so beautifully logical in the way he speaks and theologically logical, of course. And I was a little surprised because he doesn't normally take uh, positions and in, in, in those sort of um, neurasthenic uh, kind of public things that are going on. But it was he really said that he pointed out that it was a kind of a, a real blatant anti-Catholicism for a magazine like The Atlantic to call this beautiful element of our faith, the rosary, the highest, most beautiful prayer that we have after the Our Father, to call it a kind of extremism or a symbol of extremism. And, and that's what I was saying earlier, that I, I do think that, again, given the true actual spiritual power of the rosary, that the kind of beautiful irony is that I think this will probably lead more people to be aware of the rosary. And, you know, as evidenced by the fact that, you know, there was a spike in rosary sales, but, you know, maybe what it'll just end up being is kind of like a little reminder for people that, oh, you know, this this is something that's out there. And, um, you know, especially for people who grew up Catholic um, to be like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I my grandmother used to do that or my mother used to do that. And, you know, who knows? But I, I could just see it leading to, you know, more people actually praying the rosary, which would be a wonderful thing. So, yeah. so thank you. Thanks, Canadian author of weird, bigoted <laughs> Atlantic articles. <laughs> yeah, I love that idea of a rosary renewal. And, you know, I think, too, like you're saying, Ashley, I think that it's a good reminder that especially there's a lot to feel hopeless about a lot of the time and you feel like there's nothing you can do. Well, you know, here is something you can do. This is a, this actually is a powerful instrument against evil. And. Um, I think I think hopefully that'll remind people and remind people that they actually do believe that. And you would think that everyone, even, you know, a non-Catholic would want people doing what they could to fight against evil. The rosary, the rosary is, is so powerful, especially when said with someone else or with your family. And. I find it to be, uh, from a family perspective, I find it to be such a beautiful formation tool for children to see mom and dad saying the rosary, encouraging the children to join them. Um, It's so, uh, it it really shapes the children's minds to understand that we're supposed to live in a constant conversation with God. Our entire day is supposed to be like that. We're supposed to wake up when we wake up in the middle of the night and think of God first. And the rosary helps us center ourselves in that in that relationship you know in that in that that beautiful meditative way you know um my husband and i very early on in our marriage just started a tradition of saying the rosary together every sunday night and you know 10 plus years later four kids later we still you know some of our kids we could just do a decade and then they go to bed but to your point about anchoring it 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 sometimes feels like, you know, the, just a little uh, tether holding our, you know, with all the gale force winds of the culture out there, just kind of holding us together. But, um, you know, so even to people listening, I think it's never, 
it's never too late to introduce the rosary. And what's so great about the rosary is you can break it down. Like you can just do one decade and that takes literally less than a minute. Um, and it's just, it's just the best. <laughs> um, it's such a great, it's such an easy thing to fold into your life. And, um, there's so many great tools out there. Like I've, you know, some of these apps, like I have a friend who, um, uses the hallow app and she's like, you can pray the rosary with Mark Wahlberg, you know, so <laughs> that's a great it, app. That's a terrific it's, app. It's just so adaptable and so easy to fold into your life. And, and to your point, Gracie, just such a, a a calming, soothing way to kind of anchor your mind. And, and I think even like the, the physical look of the rosary, it's kind of like it, it, it ties everything together. You know, it's all these little beads, but they're tied together. And it just sort of invites you to just just latch on to one bead and then you're sort of in, in the full in the flow. Um, but it's it's a wonderful um, spiritual tool. In the last in yep. the last few days, I've been I've been very my husband and I have been very sad of a good couple this couple this friend of ours who were very close to they lost their son in an accident a 26 year old who very friendly all the life with my older my eldest our eldest son and yesterday was the the funeral and this is this is a Catholic family of Catholic you know church on Sundays and and that's wonderful. Um, but I'd never seen them. I've never seen them say the rosary or talk about the rosary. And yesterday at the funeral, they were all. Each of them was carrying a rosary. Everyone, maybe there were two hundred people at mass. Many hands were holding rosaries. The rosary really felt like a some kind of like a life buoy to our, to God, to hope, to 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 salvation. And it was it was such a beautiful physical thing of people holding their rosaries in their hands. That's beautiful. Um, did they hand them out at the at the service, or did people did everyone just decide to bring them on their own? Do you know? People just brought their rosaries. Um, in wow. fact, my friend, uh, the mother of the of the of the poor boy, um, she was given many rosaries. People were visiting her home and and uh, leaving flowers on the doorstep with rosaries um, wrapped around the stems. I'm getting teary-eyed thinking about it because <laughs> it's very fresh. Yeah. But it was it was truly beautiful the way that people's minds immediately ran to Our Lady, to her favorite prayer, to the Rosary. Which you know, when you're when you're in terrible grief, holding those beads in your hand and the cross, the crucifix, you really feel like you're holding God in your hands in a, in a strange sense. Maybe well, I hope sure. I'm not. I hope I'm not exaggerating f- from a theological yeah. perspective. <laughs> but I, that actually reminds me of something that uh, Brian Ashley's husband told me once when I was talking about an experience I'd had with someone who was really, I, I won't get into her, but anyway, um, we started talking about the Blessed Mother, and he was like, Lee, of course it makes sense. When you're upset or you're hurt or you're sad, you want your mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, of course, I know, your husband's the best. And um, it uh, and that just reminds me of that. Like, of course, like everyone wanted to be comforted, you know, in Mary's mantle that day with all the grieving and everything. You just want to be, you know, held and loved in that comfort. And the rosary brings you into that. Yes, it was it was very beautiful to watch everybody run, run to the mother, <laughs> run to the mother, the only one who can who can help, as you say, everyone needs her in their time of need. You know, I hate to switch gears because we're having such a beautiful talk about the rosary, but we also wanted to touch upon something else that happened in the news in the last couple of weeks. And it's it's rather a, a dark and gruesome story. And we should all pray the rosary about this, too, um, because these are real people enmeshed in real, you know, evil things and sad things, things of the devil, really. Um, and this is that story out of Nebraska about a, a woman um, who helped her child obtain her daughter, her 17 year old daughter, obtain uh, drugs illegally on the Internet to abort at home her 30 week old infant, her baby, and then dispose of the body in, in some horrible, undignified way. And the people, you know, the authorities found out about it because of Facebook messages between them. Everything you put on the internet is public. And the the, the terrible way that they spoke about the baby, the thing inside of her, it was, it was a very tragic, tragic, just gruesome thing to watch and, and, to, and to hear about. Something seems sort of strange about it. I mean, I agree. The whole situation is is very sad and tragic um the their messages were so strange like i don't understand why you know i don't know i i won't get into it but i thought something seemed a little strange about it but what i will say is that it was so so clear in the article that reported the story that 
they were trying to suggest that, you know, prosecuting uh, women who have abortions is the direction that, you know, the pro-life movement is going in, even though they had to put in there a line basically acknowledging that that in no way has the pro-life movement really focused on that, that they focused right. on the CD providers and the people who are exploiting these women. Um, but, you know, the what what they don't talk about is the fact that the pro-choice movement has even before jobs been aggressively doing like a hard turn towards these mail order pills or whatever, which is what this 17 year old girl used with no directive that appears from any doctor. So she was able to easily access these strong medications strong enough that they um, end the life of an unborn child, even at 30 weeks when that baby is, you know, strong, healthy, and definitely viable. Right. Um, and, and they're, this is what they want. They want these pills just widely available for anyone and anybody. And, you know, thankfully the mother didn't die too, because, um, you know, when you read reports of what it's actually like to take those medicines, even early on in your pregnancy, many women who've had abortions and have had both surgical and medical have said that, um, the, the pill abortion is much more traumatizing and painful and lasts several days. And, you know, I mean, for the, for the movement that tried to coin the phrase safe, legal, and rare, I mean, how in, how on earth is it safe for these medications um, to be so easily accessed that, you know, this mom and her daughter were able to just get them and, and, and do this. I mean, there's no discussion in the article or the reporting about, the, the health and safety risks to the mother um, who went through this. I know. And who are the unscrupulous uh, pharmacists? I don't know. You know, who accepted the money and sold them these pills without any assurance of, you know, what trimester she was in. Um, the fact that she could even, you know, there's no regulating body that can stop a 30 week, you know, pregnant woman from obtaining and taking these pills. It's, the, it's the wild west in the extreme um and it's i mean grace you you talk about this all the time about the dangers of this and that, that you know that these are the new back alley abortions um and I, mean, I don't i don't know how do you what do you do how do you stop this well it's so terrifying to think that the she basically induced her own pregnancy i mean i'm sorry her own labor and gave birth mm-hmm. to a big baby at home right. In the bathtub, I think I read somewhere. Yeah. And this is, she had a labor and a delivery induced at home of a big baby. This this is not it's something. Not yes, medically, obviously it kills the baby. Most Or maybe the baby was born alive. I don't know if they've determined that. But medically, this is a horrendous experience for the mother. Very dangerous. Nobody, if somebody said to you, oh, you're almost due. Why don't you induce your own birth in your bathtub? with these strong medicines that you can get on the internet. Like why wait for another couple of weeks and deliver in the hospital with all the, with all the, maybe that has inconveniences that you want to avoid. Um, and the would, tragedy that's her own mother mm-hmm. that's helping her do this. I mean, that just, it floors me. Well then, and then on top of that, like, as you said, Ashley, the baby's viable at 30 weeks. So if she had yeah. just held on for another two months, um, she could have, given birth to the baby, the baby would have been adopted out to some lovely couple that's been hoping for a baby for a long time. I mean, it was a, it was, it was ugliness upon ugliness and very dangerous for, for the baby's mother, obviously for the baby. And, and yes, we are going into this wild west um, situation where you can get anything on the internet and there's going to be a very uh, hands-off um, approach from the FDA to internet uh, illegal internet sales of these very strong medications, and they will be used on very big babies uh, and on and on young girls, on people who are women who are being trafficked, um, men, you know, pimps who have a stable of women that that need to be free of pregnancy so they can keep working for him, and all these yeah, all these things are going to be happening all around us and. And we have to be very vigilant and aware of it and and keep fighting the war against abortion on that front specifically, because uh, as you said, Ashley, it's, it's something that the, that the pro abortion left is pushing very strongly. And, and never mind just the, 
the psychological psychological trauma to this girl of having to bury and then exhume the infant's remains multiple times and then burning them. I mean, I, I don't, you know, physically having given birth four times, thankfully in a hospital setting with good medical care. I mean, I have many friends who've given birth close to 30 weeks, some because they went into premature labor, some because they had twins. Um, and to your point, you know, that, that baby could have been born um, and been kept alive and been placed into a very loving home at 30 weeks. Um, you know, my cousin was born at 30 weeks and he's a six foot five healthy, active track runner who's headed to college. Um, but again, just no, no regard for, um, what the poor mother went through and, and sort of the psychological trauma of it all. And and to your point about the FDA, the FDA is the one that's out there trying to make it easier Mm -hmm. for any of these, um, you know, pill abortions, whether it's plan B or the, um, the, the one that comes after that, they're the ones that are, are trying, I mean, clearly because they're being pushed and lobbied by the abortion industry, um, to make the, basically to disconnect those medications from any medical care. Um, and, uh, you know, given how just sort of, um, dangerous it all is, it's, it's, it's a real scandal. Well, I'm sorry to say we're out of time, ladies. Uh, I'm sorry to end on that sad note. Maybe we should have started with that story and then moved on to the beautiful rosary story. Uh, It would have been better, a better flow. But thank you for joining me today. It's really, really nice to have you on with me. I love it. Great to be with you, Gracie. to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie on EWTN Radio. We've invited our friend Nikki Neely. She founded the organization called Parents Defending Education, one of my my most favorite organizations. Welcome back to the show, Nikki. Thank you for having me. Nikki, I am a huge fan of your organization and of your work. I do think it's critical right now. It's a critical part of all the efforts that are being made all across the country to recapture our children to take them back from the academic establishment, which has changed so much since you and I were in school and since many of our listeners were in school. I think that the landscape is somewhat maybe incomprehensible to most parents or or grandparents or aunts and uncles. Is this true? Absolutely. As you said, it is light years away from what we grew up with and what many people remember from even 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, And so it's really, it's something that should be the front of mind for people who have young children in particular. And why should everyone care, though, even if you're not a parent? Because a lot of people who listen to our show are not parents or no longer, or maybe they moved on to grandparenthood or their aunts and uncles or just friends. Why should people care even if they don't have children in school? Sure. Well, what's happening in the public schools, obviously, is being done with our tax dollars in our name. Mm -hmm. Um, But even beyond that, I mean, the kind of children that are in school today are tomorrow's statesmen, politicians, leaders. And so the values that are being taught in school or sadly not being taught will have a future impact on our country. And so it definitely is something that everyone should worry about. Okay, and what about the fact that this is not just in public schools? Well, yeah, and that's something that is so fascinating to me is I speak to so many people, conservatives, parents, apolitical people who say, well, I have my child in private school, in parochial school, I homeschool. How does this affect me? Um, And what we tell people is, unfortunately, a lot of this rot is also creeping over to private schools as well. And so just because your child might not be in a public school doesn't mean that you're safe from it. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, everybody who owns a home or rents a home, you know, people move to neighborhoods to districts because of their schools and so if schools start to go completely off the rails it actually ends up impacting home prices too which is something i didn't think about a year ago but it really does have implications for absolutely everybody no that you make a very good point and and in schools that aren't public private schools whether they're parochial or other kinds of private schools how do these things infiltrate these schools because where are they coming from they're not in the curriculum i don't think that the archdiocese for instance chooses so where is it coming from (laughs) unfortunately it's kind of coming from everywhere. Sometimes there'll be 
a family that requests something, sometimes it will come from a teacher. We saw just a few weeks ago, actually, there was a school in the Boston Diocese where the archbishop said, you can't call yourself a Catholic school anymore because of the kinds of gender ideology that were being taught in the school. It's coming from below, it's coming from above, and it's also coming from outside actors, organizations, nonprofits, gender organizations, um, racial justice organizations that are putting pressure on these schools and putting pressure on some of these schools' donors to get more involved in um, in, in value-laden issues. How about the training that our teachers uh, receive? How is that affecting the way our children are being taught? Yes, absolutely. It's, um, you know, who is teaching our teachers? That's a wonderful point. In many schools, there are teachers have to do something called professional development. Um, in my children's schools, you know, school will be closed every six weeks or so for the teachers to do some kind of all day training session. And so in a lot of those sessions, um, you know, you kind of expect, okay, well, maybe they'll learn the teachers will talk about phonics education, or they'll talk about kind of best practices. But what ends up being uh, happening, and particularly over the past two years in the wake of George Floyd, there's been a lot of focus on equity, on identity issues. Um, the buzzwords these days are social and emotional learning, um, you know, children's mental health in the wake of the pandemic. And so um, it's kind of under the guise of some of these programs where, um, you know, parents hear things like we're going to talk about bullying prevention. And of course, you know, we want our children to, you know, learn why bullying is a bad thing. But in the course of a lot of those professional development sessions, identity politics, implicit bias issues, and again, heavy value laden issues, gender, um, skin color, um, things like that end up being incorporated. And then promoted to teachers that then turn around and implement that pedagogy in the classroom. I've been having a very eye-opening experience myself on all this. I, I was appointed by Governor DeSantis to the Board of Education of Florida, and this was back in March. I've been paying such close attention, and it's it's an enormous undertaking, of course, to try to understand the, um, the schools uh, and all the educational efforts of a state like Florida, which is so enormous. But one of the things that uh, I've learned is that uh, in inside our textbooks that our children are reading, even math textbooks, there are uh, these these concepts that are being built into the the curriculum, not directly, but indirectly from the bottom up, as, as it were, for, or from the outside in. How does the how do you feel about curricula and the way that it's it's shaped? It's absolutely fascinating. And again, I mean, these are things that parents don't think about. You know, your child goes to school and they have a textbook. Well, who picks the textbook? Where are the recommendations come from? Governor DeSantis has been a tremendous leader nationwide in saying, you know, these are the books, these are the 54 sets of curriculum that are off the table because of the kinds of insidious underlying issues that are being that are, that are put into these these books. Um, again, you never think about in math. Why would you talk about racial justice in math? I mean, this is algebra. This is you know addition and subtraction. I spoke to a family about a year ago who was putting a, ch uh, a kindergartner into Atlanta public schools. It was a Catholic family kindergartner, five year old, and so the the father called the school and said, you know, we're we're, we're religious. I'd like to just opt my child out in advance about all sexual curriculum. Is there a form I can fill out. And the district told him, well, you can't do that. And he said, well, what do you mean I can't do that? She, she's five years old. And they said, well, it's in everything. It's in health. It's in science. It's in math. It's in reading. And he said, hold on. Why are you talking to my five-year-old about sex in math class? It's just, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling because you don't think about those things as a teacher, as, as a parent. And so it's it's really worrisome because, again, as you said earlier, the kinds of lessons, the, the way school was when we were growing up is light years away from what it is today. Mm -hmm. It is terrifying because when we think about talking to children about sex, we think, well, this is it, we have to, first of all, protect children's innocence, right? Like we don't want them to know anything about sex for many years, uh, the beginning of their lives. And then when the topic is introduced, it's introduced in a certain setting involving a certain attention to the moral significance of sexuality and where it belongs. For instance, for Catholics like us in a in the sacramental marriage of one man and one woman. But the schools have a different idea. And unfortunately, I spent some time, too much time on Twitter. There's this um, Twitter feed called Libs of TikTok. And there it shows very many teachers who voluntarily, these are teachers, can be teachers of kindergartners, first graders, second graders, go on TikTok and make little videos about how they're indoctrinating children. This is very scary. I don't recommend anyone to do this at 3 a.m. because you'll lose the rest of your night's sleep. Or is this kind of thing that's being um, highlighted by a Twitter feed like Libs of TikTok, is that kind of thing really happening across the country? Unfortunately, it is really happening. And I think, you know, it's 
kind of ugly to say that there is a silver lining to COVID, but I think it did give parents a very abrupt window into their children's education because much of what has been happening for the past 10, 20 years has been taking place behind closed doors. I have a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old, and when they would come home from school, I would ask, how was your day? What did you learn? And they'd say, we had pizza. It was great. But they wouldn't give me any more information. And I would get an email from the teacher once a week. Well, we talked about the 60s in history class. Well, what part of the 60s did you talk about? Did you talk about the hills or did you talk about weather underground? We want to know what's going on. And it was really interesting to me that when last year during when in September, when school started to go back into session, there was part of me that wondered, well, will this parent movement fizzle out? Will this be kind of an out of sight, out of mind issue? Because you know, people are just sick of, of the hassle and that, that things would go back to normal. And what we found was that parents were even more worried than they were when Zoom school was taking place because now they had no idea what was taking place in the classroom. And through libs of TikTok, through other, I mean, we have a tip line at Parents Defending Education and we still receive between 50 to 200 tips a week from across the country. People who see handouts, people who see lesson plans, and they're worried about it. And so it does, I think, you know, because of accounts like Libs of TikTok, where they show us what the teachers are saying and doing. And, you know, and in, in those cases, it's the teacher's own words bragging about the kinds of lessons, bragging about undermining parental rights, or I'm going to teach this regardless of what state law is. It really does show you that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. We can't just trust that our schools will teach our children appropriately anymore. We have to verify what's actually taking place behind closed doors. And what do you say to people who say, well, that's just bigotry. You don't want the, your, your child, your son, your daughter to go out into the world and experience the world as it really is and with a different set, with different sets of ideals. What do you say to that? It is incumbent on us as parents to inculcate values to our children. We send our children to school to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. And looking at the statistics over the past two years of learning loss, that obviously did not take place. Our children have huge amounts of, of, of education to make up. And sadly, I mean, education, it really is a zero-sum game. They have our children for seven, eight hours a day. And if they're spending four of those hours on social justice issues, on talking about sexuality or gender or identity politics, they're not making up that reading, those phonics, science classes that they should be making up. And I think that's something that you know, we really worry about. And so leave it to me as a mother to talk to my child about issues like sexuality at a time and a place of my choosing and in a method of which I choose. I don't want to outsource that. And we as parents shouldn't outsource that to other people. In Florida, we passed a law that says it's a parental rights and education law, which is really all about transparency and giving parents a real open window into the classroom and the ability to to uh, respond when they see something that's that's wrong. You know, the part that set everybody's hair on fire is that the law says that children should not have any instruction or education in sexuality through third grade. So just through third grade, we're not going to talk to them about sex. People call this all over the country. The left calls it the don't say gay bill. Why did everyone's hair catch on fire over this? It's, I think part of the reason people's hair caught on fire is because it was so grossly miscarried characterized by the mainstream media. When I talk to people on the ground, actually the most frequent question I get is, why stop at third grade? Why does this not go to fifth grade? Why does this not go to seventh grade? Why are teachers talking about these deeply, deeply personal, extremely graphic issues in the classroom anyway? Poor Governor DeSantis was really, he was villainized by the press for something that just said, this shouldn't be part of the curriculum. It's not prohibiting teachers from talking about, or, or children from talking about their family composition. It's explicit curriculum. Mm -hmm. And again, as you said earlier, I love that. Why are why are these teachers, why are these schools so intent on ripping our children's innocence away? These are children who believe in the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. So why do we have to talk to them about really, really oftentimes grotesque, graphic things that I don't discuss as an adult? We shouldn't be talking about that with small, small children. There's a feeling out there that, that you sense that, and sometimes it's explicitly said, that the children don't belong to the parents. They belong to the school system to educate and form and get infused with a set of values that they're the, they're going to take out into the world and, and reshape the world along the so certain lines. How did we get to this point, this walk away from the parental, the idea that, that it's the parents who decide for the children? That was something that former Governor Terry McAuliffe said in the Virginia election last year. And it's one of the reasons he lost that election is that it shouldn't be up to parents to determine what their children learn. And people just fundamentally disagree with that idea. Our children are not mere creatures of the state. That's actually something that the Supreme Court has found. Um, children are, parents have a right to raise, to direct the upbringing of their children. And so I think there is a school of thought, um, unfortunately, among politicians, among activists that think, all right, public schools, tax dollars, 
We get to determine what you learn so that you can be a productive member of society, but we define what society is and we determine what values you need and don't need. And sadly, that's why we're seeing a lot of schools turn away from you know very basic things. Again, reading, writing, and mathematics, focusing more on social justice activism. That's not how we you know maintain a, re a republic for another 250 years. Um, our children have to be able to you know, learn these basic things um, and, and so that they can thrive and determine what they want to do, not what the state and not what politicians want them to do. I don't even see how we maintain a demography for the next few, for the next couple of generations, teaching children the way we've been teaching them in school or the way that we've allowed the schools to teach them. So many young people now identify as non-heterosexual and they're not even able to form families and make children. How is this? I, I, I have trouble understanding how this makes any sense in a, in a world that wants to be sustainable, a sustainable population, a, a country where people have, you know, suburban streets with families in each in each house and the children playing outside. That doesn't even seem to be in the future for these for these people. Like they don't see they don't see the world in, in those terms, the ways regular people do or conventional people do. Tell us, though, Nikki, about your organization, what you're doing, how you do it, and how we can participate. Sure. Well, what we want to do is we want to give parent, parents, individuals, grandparents, the knowledge and the tools they need to be better advocates for their children. What we have seen over the past two years is the people who, the, who we assumed were taking care of our children, that did have our children's best interests at heart, didn't. So organizations like teachers unions that fought to keep schools closed, the National School Board Association that called parents domestic terrorists. We assumed that these organizations had our children's best interests at heart and they didn't. And so we need to teach parents what their rights are so that they can stand up for their children. Because at the end of the day, we are the only ones who actually will. And so we tell parents what their rights are, what their children's rights are, so that they know where the red lines are. So if and when schools cross those lines, they know that something has to happen about it. We then also, we work to expose the bad deeds, the bad things that are taking place in schools. We have a tip line and we've been receiving tons of tips. I mean, 50 to 200 a week since we launched last March. Almost everybody who sends us a tip sadly wants to be anonymous because they fear retaliation, not only against themselves, but against their children. So we tell their stories. As the saying goes, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And as we have exposed these egregious things that have been taking place in classrooms across the country, it's been fascinating to watch all of these schools scramble and say, oh, that was a mistake. Hundreds, thousands of mistakes across the country that are being rectified because we are bringing accountability to this process. Every teacher in this country now thinks, is this going to end up on TV tonight? And they're changing their lesson plans accordingly. Well, I think that's really important. People obviously have been fleeing the public school system, going to private schools. Um, and so I think really exposing what's taking place and encouraging people to find a solution and a school that works for your family is really making a difference. And then finally, we're trying to tell people how they can get involved. Questions to ask your school, your, your teacher, your school board about racial issues, about uh, gender issues, ways to start an, a, a Facebook group, ways to start an anonymous Instagram account. What does what does being a school board member mean? What's the difference between a PTA and a PTO? Because knowledge is power. Once people know these things, they're more confident in speaking up and speaking out. I absolutely agree. There's it's so opaque to most of us the the bureaucracy and the and the layers of control and the way only certain people can speak to certain people and then you get no feedback. So it's wonderful that you you know give those tools to parents and to people in general. Right? It doesn't have to be a parent to make those. Uh, connections and, and able to fight back. Where can they find you? Sure. Our website is defendinged.org. People can sign up to become a member. They can um, look at the different incidents that have come in through our tip line on our indoctrination map. We have guides to uh, resources about rights, um, which we have translated both into Spanish as well as Chinese. And our engagement guides, different tips on how people can be involved. Um, there's information about lawsuits that we file, different campaigns we're running. At the moment, the Biden administration is trying to change Title IX by by adding sexual orientation and gender identity into the statute. And so we're helping people to submit comments to the Federal Register opposing this radical transformation of the federal education bureaucracy. Um, and so things like that, really showing people and walking them along the path uh, of activism to take them from OK to good to great, because at the end of the day, this is the most important battle that any of us will be in to defend our children, keep them safe and, and protect their interests. Really agree with you. Thank you for sharing all this information with us today. And now Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a joy for me to be with you as we enter into the consequential conversation the risen Lord Jesus wants to have with each of us this Sunday. As Jesus, by means of a parable on seats at a dinner gathering, teaches us about the humility necessary to come to the eternal wedding banquet. 
The parable flatly contradicts the way many in the world, including sometimes many of us Christians, behave. We see it in the ever-growing number of award shows indulging the ego of those in film, television, and music as they give out awards for best actors, actresses, directors, producers, graphic artists, costume designers, film editors, hairstylists, production designers, sound mixers, screenplay writers, you name it. We see it in the honors we give to students who are most popular or most likely to succeed, to the best-looking women in beauty pageants, to the most successful sales representatives, to the most valuable player in sports leagues, and even to the best-groomed dogs. So many of us have been raised with the desire not only to be the best, but to be acknowledged as the best. And if we recognize begrudgingly that we're not the best, we at least want to be better than those with whom we come into contact. We want to get our own way rather than conceding to the wishes of others. We want to get the last word rather than giving it to someone else. We want to be the ones noticed and thanked and resented if others get the credit we think we deserve. In short, we hunger to be noticed Noticed, esteemed, and exalted. We want the place of honor at table, first class seats on airplanes, and front row seats at concerts. We long for positions of power and influence, and titles of status and worldly honor. Jesus, however, calls us as his disciples to a different standard, a higher standard that is at the same time paradoxically a lower one. He tells us in this Sunday's Gospel, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He who elsewhere in the gospel told us, learn from me for a meek and humble of heart, whose whole life was a lesson in humility, wants to help us to learn from him how to serve rather than be served, to seek the lowest place rather than the highest, to treasure God's esteem rather than others' adulation, so that God may say to us in this world and in the next, the words of the host in this Sunday's parable, my friend, come up higher. The way to be exalted at Jesus' right side forever is humbly to serve at Jesus' side here on earth, to follow him not just in seeking the lowest places at table, but in getting up from the table like he did during the Last Supper, picking up the basin and towel to wash others' feet, and serving them in such self-effacing ways. To become meek and humble of heart like Jesus, especially in a proud and self-exalting age, is obviously easier said than done. We must first know what humility is, and then know and choose the means by which we can grow in humility. Let's begin, therefore, with what humility means. Humility comes from the Latin word humus, which means ground or dirt. It has various connected spiritual meanings. It means first that we have both of our feet on the ground, that we have a deep sense of who we are. As we hear every year on Ash Wednesday, we recognize we're dust, and unto dust we shall return. We acknowledge our human weaknesses and limitations. At the same time, however, humility means that even though we know we're dust, we also recognize that God has breathed into us the breath of life, that he calls us through a humble life to greatness, to a communion of love and life with him and others. To use St. Paul's image, we're vessels of clay carrying within an enormous treasure. To be humble, we need to keep both of these things in mind. To be humble doesn't mean to think that we're losers. Consistent with the overall message of the gospel, it means rather that we're ex-captive, who have been liberated by Jesus and have become adopted children of the King. Humility means never forgetting where we have come from, but also remembering the greatness that a relationship with God confers on us. Knowing what humility is, we can now turn to how to grow in it. I'd like to mention five practices. The first is to value God's love and live in it. One of the things that spawns pride, that drives us up, drives us to prop ourselves up and seek better places at tables, is that we don't always remember who we are in God and the greatness we bear as his beloved children. We seek worldly honor, esteem, and purchase because psychologically we think we need them. We don't recognize how much God esteems and loves us, how much he's honored us by adopting us into the royal family, and how he already has ready for us the greatest seats of all in heaven, provided that we're able to abase ourselves on earth enough to be exalted to take those places at the eternal banquet. The more we focus on who we really are in God's eyes, the more we will see that worldly honors are a vanity of vanities, and sometimes even a millstone. The second practice to grow in humility is truly to prioritize the love of others. As we grow in our awareness of God's love for us, we can't help but grow in awareness of God's love for others. And that helps us to prioritize their interests over ours. In this Sunday's parable, Jesus tells us that when we're throwing a dinner party, not to invite our family, friends, wealthy neighbors, and those who can return the favor, but rather those who can never repay us, namely the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. 
and to do so not out of largesse or condescension, but out of love, recognizing how special the poor are to God and what their true status is before him. One of the reasons why we fight for seats at table rather than for towels to wash others' feet is because we struggle to love others sincerely. When we really love someone, however, we want them to have the best seats, even if that means we sit behind them. When we truly love someone, we want them to be praised, well-fed, helped, and happy. That's why, when we grow in true love of others such that we serve them willingly, we become humbler, without often even knowing it. The third practice to grow in humility is humble prayer. Not all prayer is humble. Jesus elsewhere tells a parable of two men who went up to the temple to pray, one a despised tax collector, the other a respected Pharisee. The tax collector sat in the back, beating his chest and crying out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee, on the other hand, sat in the front to be noticed and prayed aloud, thanking God for not making him a loser like so many others to whom he was arrogantly comparing himself. Jesus tells us that only one of the two left the temple in a right relationship with God, the humble tax collector, not the proud and self-righteous Pharisee. We too are called to pray humbly and to pray specifically for the gift of humility. One of the most helpful prayers I've ever found to do this is Cardinal Mary Delval's Litany of Humility, printed everywhere on the internet and in every solid prayer book, which I strongly recommend for you to pray. The fourth practice Christ teaches us to grow in humility is to accept well the sufferings and humiliations we must endure. We can't be human without experience and suffering, embarrassment, put down, and various other highly unpleasant circumstances. These things, however, can make us bitter or better, depending upon whether we relate them to the Lord and give him permission to draw good out of them for us. When a proud, self-reliant man, for example, gets hospitalized and becomes so dependent that a nurse has to even change his bedpans, it can make him humble quickly if he responds to the help with gratitude rather than grumbling. The cross of suffering and humiliations help us to die to our ego. And one of the reasons why God allows us to endure such things is precisely so that they can help us grow in humility. Humility is far more valuable than whatever we lose in the circumstances of suffering. The fifth and last practice I'll mention are the sacraments. Every sacrament is an admission that we're not self-sufficient, that we need God in his grace. In each sacrament, we go to God with empty hands and ask him to give us himself in the way we need. We can highlight two sacraments that God allows us to receive over and again that help us grow in humility. The first is the sacrament of penance and reconciliation in which we recognize our sins and failings, but even more importantly, the infinite treasure of God's mercy. There's no better way to fight against pride than to examine our conscience, see that we're not who we ought to be, that in our words, actions, thoughts, and omissions, we have greatly sinned and strayed big time from the path of Christ's footsteps, and humbly to go to God through one of his priests for mercy. The second sacrament is the Holy Eucharist, which is perhaps the greatest means of all that we can use to learn from Jesus who is meek and humble of heart. On Calvary, Jesus hid only his divinity. In the Eucharist, he hides even his humanity under the appearances of bread and wine. He becomes so small in order to feed us, to serve us, to change us, to make us holy from the inside. When we enter into Holy Communion with him, we ourselves learn how to become small and humble, how to decrease so that he and others can increase, so that together with him we can go out to serve others in such a way that through us and our Christian example, they themselves might follow us on the way of humility and have God one day say to them as well, Friend, come up higher. As we come to receive Jesus in Holy Communion this Sunday, let us ask him for ourselves and for others. O oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts humble like yours. Amen. Thank you, Father Landry. To hear more from Father Landry, check out his website at catholicpreaching.com. And you can also catch his writings at EWTN's own National Catholic Register. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us. I hope that this show was helpful. I hope that it gave you more peace and more hope and more joy. And you go with our prayers. 